Lights, camera, action. Whatever it is. Welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast with Haley and Matt Schmidt. Happy Friday. Yes, happy Friday indeed. What's going on in the Schmidt household? Anything new? Uh, well, this is the first time we've recorded after Thanksgiving. And I know our last episode we just assumed that Thanksgiving would go well, but... It, it went off pretty well. We weren't in the car as much as we thought because we decided to cut one trip out, but... It was good. We got to spend time with everyone, got to see family, friends, ate lots of good, tasty food, so mm-hmm. another success. I Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, so I was really happy with it. I yeah. love it. Except when you were stressed out in the car, <laughs> driving in the snow. Yeah, yeah. Driving in bad weather is never fun, but... On the whole, Thanksgiving's a great holiday, and this was another good one. Yep. I ended up losing in fantasy football, so Mm. I'm buying beer for the draft party next year. So they're going to be getting cases of Keystone and... Red? Keystone Red? If I can find it. (laughs) Uh, Otherwise, just Keystone Light, and I don't know what the cheapest beer I can find will be. So (laughs) that's what it'll be. Well, sorry to hear that um, oh, I, fantasy football season didn't go as well as you had wanted. In that one league. Yeah. But that's the one I care about the most. So, and then I went and saw The Lighthouse earlier today. We're not talking about it today, but I saw it at the cheap, cheap as in inexpensive theater. That was an experience. I mean, I like that theater, but it was, you know, me and one other person in the theater. And then this woman came in, like, right at the start. And just stood in the aisle for the first 10 minutes of the movie. What? And then, yeah. And so I was kind of keeping my eye on her. And she would, like, walk up and down the aisle. Like, she was trying to figure out where she wanted to sit. But that was for, like, 10 minutes. And then she finally sat down. And then 10 minutes later, she got up and left. And she never came back in the theater. Wow. All right. Yeah. So that was interesting. (laughs) Did you like the movie? It was really weird. It was good. I don't... I don't love it. Like, I, I'm not going to say what my score is right now, because maybe I'll talk about it at some point in, in a future episode. Um, it's it's getting great reviews. It's in the 90s or something like that on Rotten Tomatoes. It was good, but it was maybe a little too out there for me. Yeah, but, just like I say, looking at trailers and stuff, it seemed too out there for yeah. me. I mean, so it's very try. psychological. It's about it's literally two people and... They slowly go insane, so things get trippy. But it was maybe a little too trippy for me. But, Mm. yeah, just didn't love it as much as I think other people like it. Yeah. Well, for the show today, we have a number of trailers for you. Uh, We've got some movie news. And then the two films that we'll be going through today are The Irishman, which is uh, new to Netflix, and then the... Best Picture from 1973, The Sting. Um, oh, and then also uh, we will... We have a will... New, new segment that we'll try out at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do a little bit of a countdown later, so stay tuned. No one can deny a good countdown, so... Mm-hmm. Okay. Trailer Parks this week. Um, new trailer came out for the full-length... Black Widow feature. So, of course, this is Scarlett Johansson um, reprising her role as Black Widow from the... Is this officially part of the MCU? Yeah, why wouldn't it be? Because, I don't know, it came up a week or two ago that I said something was part of the MCU and it wasn't, well, then, and, you know, so then, I just wanted to double the check. The MCU is just, it's that specific Avengers universe. Okay. So anyone think, who's been in the Avenger movies is the MCU. Okay. Oh, because I think I had brought up Deadpool. I, yeah. Deadpool and, and was X-Men. not. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Which those two are in the same universe. They'll be. They'll join the MCU eventually, but. 
Perfect. Clear as mud. I like it. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's actually, it's not that bad. I get it now. Um, okay, so obviously Scarlett Johansson is the, is in this. We also have Rachel Weisz. You probably know her from, I always think of her in The Mummy. You said you always think of her from The Constant Gardener. Yeah, that's one of my, I say a lot of movies are one of my favorite movies, but that one, I... I remember I didn't know anything about it, and then in high school or something like that, I watched it for the first time. And I love conspiracy movies, or like you know, I mentioned it with like Michael Clayton in an earlier episode. I love you know uh, conspiracy movies or investigato- investigatory movies. If I'm saying that word right, and Constant Gardner is one of those, so that's why I latch onto that. And she, that's her Oscar win. She won the Oscar for that movie. Yeah, uh, her. I mean, at least the most recent thing that I'm aware of is she was in uh, The Favorite last year, which was a Best Picture nominee. Love that movie, by the way. Um, And uh, a face that I was not expecting in this one is David Harbour, who is, he plays Hopper in Stranger Things. That's Mm -hmm. probably what most people know him from. He's doing uh, the new, um, help me out, what's the other movie superhero character that he's playing? Um, Hellboy. Hellboy. Yeah, He's also he, Hellboy. he did Hellboy. I think that's one. I never saw it. I love Hellboy. I've read the comics on Hellboy. I love the Guillermo del Toro, Ron Perlman Hellboys. That one, I the one with David Harbour, I didn't see. I was I was excited for it when the trailers were coming out because it looked like it was going to be more true to the comics. But when the reviews came out, it just, it got destroyed. So I I didn't end up seeing it and. It's nice to see David Harbour in hopefully a good superhero movie uh, because, yeah, it, from what I've read, the the whole production of Hellboy seemed like a mess, so I'm sure he's happy to hopefully be in a good movie again. Yeah. And say, what, what are your thoughts uh, after seeing this first trailer? I'm excited. I think the MCU is to the point where you just have to assume they're going to be good. Mm-hmm. I mean... The, I mean, not every single MCU movie has been good, but they've been good for a while. The the ones that I would call not good were kind of in the phase one stage of the of the franchise, uh, like Incredible Hulk or Iron Man two. Those were back, you know, when they were kind of figuring it out. Still, I think at this point you can't you have to assume it's good. It looks like uh, the first thing I thought of when I saw this was Jason Bourne. It just looks like a Jason Bourne movie, but with Scarlett Johansson. I think uh, it it's going to be similar to Winter Soldier, where it's more of a spy thriller, and that's what I really loved about Captain America Winter Soldier. Like, you could just pretend it wasn't even a superhero movie, and it would have just yeah. been a good it's espionage a good, movie. Mm-hmm, exactly. And I think this one's going to be similar, one, because, I mean, she is a spy, that's what her job is, but also she doesn't have superpowers. So you, it's just going to have to rely on some of those more espionage, uh, you know, themes for a movie. So yeah. that's what I'm picking up from the trailer. And, yeah, I think that's maybe part of the reason why I'm not... This isn't super high on my list. I think you're right that, it, you know, it'll probably end up being a good movie because Marvel's been putting out good movies. But, yeah, I think... Well, I think especially towards, like, the last few Avengers movies, I didn't feel like... Like, I feel like early on, like, Black Widow, like, she did a lot of, like, really cool things. Like, I liked, you know, she had, like, different disguises and things like that. Like, I loved that aspect of it, but I feel like the later Avengers movies, they didn't tap into that with her character very much, and she just uh, felt kind of boring. So, that's one thing I worry about a little bit with this one. I just, I I think because recently that's kind of what she's been like. I don't know what the movie might actually entail, but... I don't think that'll be an issue with this movie. I think that you might have gotten that feeling because... As the Avengers movies got bigger, you got more and more characters. Mm, yes, so you're exactly. you're gonna focus on the the bigger name people like Iron Man, Thor, Captain America. So some of those other characters are just gonna get less screen time. I mean, Endgame she had a big role. I mean, she's the one who you know, spoiler alert, she's only sacrificed herself and had some emotional scenes. Uh, so I don't know. I think. I think this is going to be good. It's just weird uh, that this is the first MCU movie that we've had since Spider-Man. This is going to be almost a year apart. Kind yeah, of it'll in, be... In, in recent years when they were kind of pumping out three or four movies a year, this is going to be 
you know, a little more spread out. Yeah, because when did Spider-Man come out? Like July? July, 4th of July weekend or yeah. close to it. And Black Widow is slated to come out May 2020. So keep that on your list for next summer almost. Mm -hmm. Keeping with the spy theme, all of our trailers this week are spy themed. So next we have the new James Bond movie, which is No Time to Die. They don't have an exact date for this one, but um, it's expected to come out April of 2020. So come out next year as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the tr I mean, I don't... The thing with Bond movies, are they're all, I feel like, for the most part, you kind of know what you're going to get. It's a lot of car chases, cool gadgets. He's going to look good in his suit. Uh, and there's going to be a villain in there at some point. So the plot-wise, I didn't get a, a whole lot from the trailer, but I'm, I'm fine with that. It still looks good. I mean, I'm not saying it looks bad. It's just I think you know what you're going to get with Bond, and I hope hopefully it's good. Yeah, I agree. So, of course, we've got Daniel Craig coming back as Bond. Uh, Rami Malek is playing the villain. I don't know if we have the a name for the villain at all. I'm not sure. Um, or if it's based on, you know, anything from any of the books. But he looks like... I, I mean, I think he's good at those darker, <clears throat> villainous, mysterious kind of roles. So I'm sure he'll do a great job. Um, Ray Fiennes is in as M. Then I didn't see her in the trailer at all, but um, if anyone saw Knives Out, which had Daniel Craig, um, we also have Anna de Armas, who played Marta in Knives Out. So the two of them are back together. Yeah, yeah. On the same screen. Yeah, so. kind of crazy. Yeah. I don't think I have anything else to add to that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a Bond movie. It it's looks a, it's a exciting. teaser. It's, yeah. it's, I hope it's good. They did, in the trailer, they showed that Christoph Waltz will be back because he was Blofeld in the last movie. And he had a scene in the trailer, so he'll be back. I don't know how much screen time he's going to get, but hopefully it's good because we're kind of on a, every other Bond movie right now, like Casino, at least with Daniel Craig, like Casino Royale was great. So good. Uh, and then Quantum of Solace, not so great. Garbage. Skyfall, I thought was fantastic. Even better. And then Spectre was kind of boring. I actually fell asleep during it. Uh, not to any of the actors' fault. Like, I think Daniel Craig is a fantastic Bond, and Christoph Waltz is a great villain. It just, the plot, it was just kind of boring. So hopefully this one will be good. I think it's tough these days, because I think back when Bond was, you know, they were pumping out a bunch of movies with Sean Connery and Roger Moore. They were really formulaic back then, where it was just... You have Bond, as long as you have a good song, <laughs> intro song. You just have this villain, Bond overcomes a villain. It was always popular. Lady. Yeah, that he ends up sleeping with. Uh, they were, it was really formulaic. It was almost the same thing over and over. As long as you made a couple tweaks and made the villains a little more interesting, they were considered good. But you, I don't think you can necessarily do that these days anymore with Bond because... There are so many good action movies out there. Even the Mission Impossible series has kind of raised the bar for action movies with Ethan Hunt, you know, kind of being a cool James Bond figure. So I think these days you kind of have to have an interesting plot or more interesting plot or more engaging storyline than you could in the past. So I think it's a little trickier these days with the Bond movies. But hopefully it's good. They say Rami Malek's going to be a different kind of villain. Uh, I think... What does that mean? Uh, he said something like he didn't want to be a stereotypical terrorist type figure. So I think they're going more... He's a, an environmental terrorist. Oh, interesting. Like, okay. He didn't want it to be like super political terrorism. Mm -hmm. but he, So I think they're going mm -hmm. with environmental terrorist. Interesting. Yeah, that's kind of a different twist on it. Yeah, the only... I can think of like Samuel Jackson and... Kingsman was an environmental yeah. kind of terrorist to an extent, but yeah, we'll see. Hopefully it's good. He's, it was weird. I don't know what's going on with Rami Malek in the trailer because they, they show his face and it looks like he has some scars on it, but not nothing that bad. Mm -hmm. But then they show that scene where he's looking like the fan of the opera. So I don't know if like something happens to him at some point in the movie where he gets more scars and puts the mask on. I, so, I mean, it's a teaser, so we, we're not supposed to know, but yeah. it's kind of intriguing mm -hmm. yeah so again that one's uh supposed to come out april of 2020 uh we also have mm. one more thing on that i don't know if you noticed in the trailer they introduced a new 007 
Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, which people are freaking out, thinking, oh, no, you're replacing James Bond. No, it's just a new 007. That's just a title. Like, Daniel Craig is still James Bond. So, because this is going to be Daniel Craig's last Bond movie. Okay. So, it'll be interesting to see if they... The future ones are going to be sequels of this universe, and they're going to be introducing a new 007 into it, or if Mm -hmm. they're just going to reboot it in four years or something like that. Interesting. Yeah, that's right. I forgot that was in there. Last note on that. Mm -hmm. So our third spy trailer for the week is called My Spy. We saw this as a trailer before. We saw a few movies over Thanksgiving. I don't remember which one we saw this before. But anyway, it's um, kind of a different take on a spy movie. So we have Dave Bautista, who plays Drax in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, Avengers movies. Uh, Ken Jeong, and then Kristen Schaal. I don't uh, know if many people know her, but the thing that I know her the best from is she plays the voice of Louise Belcher and Bob's Burgers, so I think she has a really recognizable voice. So you might not know her face, but I'm sure people probably recognize her voice. Um, So this is kind of a goofy take on a spy movie. So uh, if I remember correctly from the trailer, Dave Bautista and Kristen Schaal, they're like doing this undercover kind of thing and some young girl like stumbles upon them yeah i think he's kind of like an underperforming spy yeah like it like it isn't a surprise that a little girl found his hideout and he's trying to like prove himself as a spy yeah so you know of course you have this big like bulky guy running around with this little girl and they're doing spy related stuff so i don't know it just it looks kind of goofy it was something a little different than some of the other trailers we talk talk about and it's kind of fit in our spy theme this week we didn't even really plan that but no yeah that was the first i'd heard of that movie yeah Um, uh, it's already coming out uh january 2020 january date hopefully that's usually movies that come on january that's usually a sign that they're not that great and this is a movie that it's meant for kids it kind of reminds me when the rock or dwayne johnson did a couple of those kids movies like the game plan where he's a football player finds out he has a daughter or the like tooth the tooth fairy, fairy. yeah so it kind of reminds me of those where yep. critically i'll be honest might not be received that well but families will go see it yeah dave bautista is a pretty funny guy i never saw stuber but he, he looked like he was pretty funny at that and he's funny as Drax because uh, he takes everything so literal he literally you know has some good jokes in there so he he's a funny guy and you know hopefully uh it'll be a movie that parents take to their kids and there'll be some jokes in there for everyone yeah yeah exactly Uh, So that's it for this week's Trailer Park. Uh, We have a few news stories uh, from the movie industry. One thing, I I don't know if you saw this, but I was, uh, you know, I was flipping through Instagram yesterday, and I follow Scott Eastwood, who, of course, is one of Clint Eastwood's kids, and he shared, um, he shared a picture on Instagram that was, I think it, at, you know, like at the top, it said like inner office memo and it said Warner Brothers 1984. And it was um, some person's ri- response to the original script or original idea for what ended up being Unforgiven. And the woman's notes on it were, <laughs> she basically said, this is garbage. I didn't even read the whole thing. This was such a waste of time. Like, don't send me this crap. And you know, Unforgiven ended up becoming a Best Picture winner. Unforgiven is one of the best movies ever made. I don't want to give away too much because we'll be reviewing it sometime, but that woman does not know what she's talking about. <laughs> Unless the script changed drastically. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, honestly, like a few things she brought up. I'm like, okay, well, a few things change, but, you know, it's it's just kind of the, the idea of don't don't give up and don't let one person's opinion stop you from... Um, achieving something great. So mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of cool. And like it, like I said, I, I know you love that movie and we've yeah. watched that one in our Best Picture yeah. journey. Have, so I wanted to bring that up. We have that, but in our basement we have movie posters on our wall and that's one of them. What sort of movie stories do you have uh, to share with me? Uh, just a couple things. Uh, this I just thought was interesting. Uh, Jack Ryan, that show with John Krasinski. I watched yeah, on season, Amazon, right? Yeah, yeah. I watched season one of it last year. I haven't watched season two yet, but 
apparently a lot of people have seen season two because this says Jack Ryan season two outperformed the boys in viewership numbers. Uh, the boys is another Amazon show. It's a superhero show that was very popular. It came out earlier this year. And I just thought that was interesting because I remember when Jack Ryan season one came out, I didn't feel like it really caught a lot of traction. I was pleasantly surprised to see that it got picked up for a season two. But when The Boys came out earlier this year, it had Seth Rogen attached to it, and it, it blew up. It became very popular. I felt like everyone was watching it. I watched it, and I would say The Boys is probably a better show than Jack Ryan, uh, even though they are different genres with a uh, spy thriller and then superhero show. But I was just a little surprised to see that season two of Jack Ryan outperformed The Boys, so kind of... Uh, well, interesting. Did you see either of those shows? I can't remember. I or, or remember. I would say I, I maybe caught one episode of Jack Ryan, um, but watched a few episodes of The Boys with you, which I really liked the take on The Boys because this this is the sort of stuff I think of when we're sitting there watching superhero movies. Like you see Hulk crash into a building, and you're like, who who takes care of this shit after you know these fights break out and yeah the boys is more like okay if we had real life superheroes in real life how it would actually work like yeah. they've got agents and pr firms and they're doing all this so it's it's a much more kind of realistic spin on the yeah, superhero story I agree. and that's why i liked it too it was a little darker too which yeah. i, I kind of i like those spins on things and as much as i would love to think of the idea of tony stark being a superhero and always doing the right thing the boys does seem more realistic where the speedster in that show like accidentally runs through people and kills them and it's like yeah there's collateral damage that happens or yeah they all work for a marketing company and they're not actually good people they they just they get sold out to cities to fight crime so yeah I, I thought The Boys is a better show than Jack Ryan I still really like Jack Ryan I'm going to watch season 2 but I just thought that was kind of interesting and surprising that that happened with the ratings something uh, i've heard that a couple other people talk about this but it's so weird and bizarre that i felt like maybe we should bring it up to the johnny depp michael jackson the hard pass this is just nope twisted it's bad it's terrible did you want to explain to the listeners who haven't heard of what it is what is going on so, my understanding of it, Johnny Depp wants to do this movie about Michael Jackson, but he wants to tell it from the story of Michael Jackson's sequin glove. Yeah, the viewpoint of the glove. Like, or what? Or perspective of. Yeah. It's just, I, no. We don't need a Michael Jackson movie. We don't need one from his glove, about his glove. I just, it seems weird. <laughs> and I think it's a play. I think he's going to be writing... It has a musical, actually, so I guess whether that's a play or a movie, it, all I see is a musical right now. Okay. Which is maybe, you know, it makes sense with Michael Jackson, but with it being the perspective of the glove, kind of weird. But, I mean, did you hear about what the glove is? Apparently, they're going to be blaming all the sex abuse that ha that he did on the glove because the glove is an alien that needs to feed on virgin blood. Oh god. Okay, yep. That's this, that's it what keeps it getting is. Worse. No, this is worse. Worse and worse and worse. Terrible. That's actually happening. Like this is a real story. When I first heard it, it was on a podcast where they kind of joke around a little bit. And I was like, Oh, are they joking? But no, this is this is serious. It's one of those things like you see like you would read like the first headline I saw about I'm like this is from the onion, right? Like this yeah. can't be real. This yeah. is it's so far fetched. Yeah, we can hard pass on that. What's the next story you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, the next things I have it's award season. We've been watching a lot of movies lately because this is when all the good award season movies are coming out. And a couple of the ceremonies, these are the smaller ones, that's why they happen earlier than some of the other ones, but some of the ceremonies have happened already, uh, so just kind of a quick thing, uh, The Irishman won Best Picture at the National Board of Reviews, Okay. and it also won Best Picture at the New York uh, Film Critic Awards. And just to put it in perspective, for the National Board of Review, these are the last 10 movies or the decade winners for the Best Picture Award. The Irishman, Green Book, which went on to win Best Picture. Mm -hmm. The Post, which was nominated for Best Picture. 
Manchester by the Sea, Mad Max Fury Road, A Most Violent Year, Her, Zero Dark Thirty, Hugo, and Social Network. All those were nominated for Best Picture, or one Best Picture except for one of them. So the Irishman winning that award is kind of a sign that, and we'll talk it's, about it's it later. It's going to be nominated yeah. for Best Picture. Yep, and I think Quentin Tarantino won Best Director at that ceremony. For Once Upon a Time yep. in Hollywood? Okay. Yep, so uh, a couple award ceremonies already going on and kind of pointing out uh, who could be potential nominees coming down the road. So I just thought that was... Uh, you know, it's always good to talk about. This is the stuff I like. I like award ceremonies and obviously the Academy Awards. So I always find this stuff kind of fascinating. Yeah, that's a good thing to keep your uh, keep on your radar, like you said, as we get into the bigger award season, once we get to Golden Globes, Academy Awards, and you can kind of see what, what might be nominated and what has a good chance of winning. One last note on that, uh, Adam Sandler won Best Actor. At Ooh, the, for Uncut Gems? Yeah, he, nice. he won for... Uh, at the, I'm, at I'm the really National excited. Board of Reviews. I'm really excited to see that. I am too. It's in our slate to watch. I'll release the schedule at some point on social media, but I'm very excited to see it. Uh, quick note, did you see what Adam Sandler said on the Howard Stern Show? No, I don't think so. He said uh, if he doesn't get nominated for an Academy Award this year, he's going to, on purpose, make the worst movie he could ever make. <laughs> Just to spite them? Yeah, <laughs> which is kind of nice. I like that he cares. I like hearing that he cares because yeah. it's kind of that you know a fandom thing where like i care so i kind of want them to care a little bit uh and a lot of actors will say that they don't care to an extent so i, I kind of like that adam sandler is you know he's joking but i kind of like that he's saying i i, I care i want to get this nomination yeah i exactly. hope he does yeah i agree shall we get into the irishman yeah let's do it non-spoilers to start out non-spoilers Okay, so we, actually this was perfect because we had said, well, you saw this in theaters a couple weeks ago and I said, eh, I don't need to see it, but it's on Netflix and we wanted to talk about it on the show, so we did go ahead and watch it. And we had said, let's break this up a little bit, and honestly it was perfect because the day we started it, um, I had seen something on Twitter that was, hey, how to watch The Irishman as a miniseries. Here are like four defining sections of the movies. If you want to break it up, here's a good way to break it up. And so the first thing what we did is we watched the first two sections, which I, I think was good because part with it being a three and a half hour long movie, I needed something to like get my focus on something and I could kind of like mentally break it up into smaller pieces. So one, that was really nice. We watched it across three, yeah. three you, different nights. Did you see all the jokes that came out in response to that breakdown that no, you saw on Twitter? No, I didn't. After that came out, a bunch of people started making fun. Like when Black Widow came out, someone made a, a break, a four part breakdown on how to watch the Black Widow trailer and like, <laughs> and how to watch. Why? Why so much hate? <laughs> this is a three and a half hour long movie. Like, come on. I, I appreciated I, I get, the timing breakdown. I get what you're saying. I'm more so on the like the end of things where I don't think people should complain about the length of this movie, but we'll get into it. I'm not complaining about the length. I'm just saying I'm glad I had something, like a frame of yeah, reference okay. to say, hey, we like we literally don't have time to yeah. sit down and watch like, this in one if sitting. You're in a pinch. Here is the best way to do so it. So what's a good way to break yeah. it up if we can? So I appreciate that. Okay. I mean, it got me to watch the movie, so <laughs> have some appreciation yep. for it, right? Yep. So we've got Robert De Niro as the the Irishman, Frank Sheeran. Joe Pesci plays Russ Buffalino, and we have. Al Pacino, who plays Jimmy Hoffa. They're kind of like the big, the three big players in this. Ray Romano's also in here, which I did not know about, and I thought he did oh, yeah. a really great job. Oh, yeah, I loved, I, yeah, Ray Romano, it was weird. I think him and Scorsese met years ago, and they just hit it off, and Marty was just like, I'm going to put you in my next movie, and that's like how he got this role. From what I understand, which I agree, he's awesome. I love Ray Romano. Yeah, so he he plays Russ Buffalino's cousin. I don't remember his first name. I think it's Bill. Bill. So we've got Frank, Russ, Jimmy Hoffa, Bill Buffalino. Another role I wanted to mention was um, Anna Paquin plays the, like, adult version of 
Frank Sheeran's daughter, Peggy. And I don't know why. Like, she's, she wasn't on screen a lot, but I, I really liked her. Okay. I'm glad you hear that. There's been some controversy about her role in this movie that's come out that we really? can get into later. Yeah I, yeah, I I thought she was great. Yeah, I I agree with you. Uh, someone to note, too, just because, I mean, this movie, Scorsese got a bunch, as as you just said, some of the actors in it, he got a bunch of the old crew Huge. in this movie with uh, De Niro. Uh, he brought Joe Pesci out of retirement uh, because, I mean, I looked at his last mo- four movies that Joe Pesci had done before this. Or a couple movies. He did a voiceover one, which I, I didn't throw in here, but his last uh, live-action role was in Love Ranch, which I've never seen, <laughs> but that was released in 2010. And then he was in The Good Shepherd in 2006, which starred Matt Damon and was directed by Robert De Niro. Uh, it got okay reviews, but the, and then the, one, the movie before that was Lethal Weapon 4 in 1998. So, so he's made... Three movies in the last 20 years. Now four wow. or whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it, it, okay. was, it was awesome seeing Joe Pesci come out of retirement, uh, especially come out of retirement, totally kill it in this role. Oh, um, he was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I guess that's what I'll say in this, you know, before we get into the plot of the movie. I I don't watch a lot of gangster movies. Um, and while, you know, the storyline, the plot, like that's not my favorite, the acting was phenomenal the set design the costume the makeup and graphics the music like everything like every piece of this movie was ticking it mm-hmm. was just it was like almost perfect yep uh, one quick note on who else is in this harvey Keitel came out yes of a semi-ish retirement it's a small role a lot smaller compared to uh, these other actor actresses that we're talking about, but it was nice seeing Harvey Keitel on the screen. Is uh, same with uh, Bobby Cannavale was in it, but I mean, I love this movie. You know, Martin Scorsese says he's my favorite director. So let's I guess go, while we're in non spoilers, let's let's dig into some of the the big things uh, that centering around this movie. The the length of it. Were you bothered by how long this movie was? Yes, I was. It was, but but I'll say. I don't think that there was anything in there that was, like, long-winded or unnecessary. Honestly, kind of how I looked at this movie, this is kind of how I felt as it was going, and then once we finished it, like, the last part earlier tonight, it 100% solidified for me. This movie is, like, the gangster version of Boyhood. Yeah. It is a... It takes place over a long period of time. Yeah, it takes place over a long period of time. It's chapters of this person's life, and it's just kind of a start to finish. Mm-hmm. And that's what it is. Yeah, there's no... I mean, there is a climactic point of view in this movie, but like for the most part, it's just kind of you're following along in his life. And his it's, life happens to be centered around these big events that happen. It's kind of... <laughs> Boyhood and Forrest Gump kind of put in <laughs> put yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was, yeah, I feel like, it, yeah, it's very similar to those two. And it's like, yeah, it's all these chapters. It's just here's the next stage of life, here's the next thing that comes up. Yeah, it wasn't like, okay, here's this major point that we're trying to get to, and now it's solved, and here's a resolution. Like, it was just, it was a more Mm even-paced kind of thing. So, was the length of time, like, bothersome just because it was three and a half? Just because it was three and a half. I just to think, like, like I said, it, I think everything that was in it was good. It was just like, oh my god, like, I'm never gonna want to watch this again because it's three and a half hours long. Okay. Were you bothered that Endgame was three hours long? No. Okay, no. Well, why? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Then why the difference? <laughs> I don't know, that's a good question. Pre- probably because Endgame had that, like, typical movie storyline where it's like, here's a rise in action, here's a climax, here's a resolution. Bunch of big action scenes to <laughs> keep us entertained. Yeah, yeah, probably. Okay, because I was not bothered by the length of time of this movie at all. I've seen it twice, once in theaters and one sitting. And I think there was one time where I kind of looked at my watch to be like, oh, how much longer is there? And there was like an hour left, but I wasn't bothered by it. I just looked at the time. So, and, then, and then the second time watching it with you in kind of chunks, Rewatching it, I kind of wanted to see, like, okay, do I think that there's anything that could be cut out of this movie? Yeah. And honestly, I don't think there is. You kind of touched on it. Uh, 
But I'm rewatching. I'm like, oh, could they take this scene out? But it's like, no, because it explains this part of his life. You need that. To, like the, I mean, Jimmy Hoffa, Al Pacino doesn't come into the movie until you're 50 minutes into it. So I was looking at kind of like, do we need that much time? But yeah, it's setting up who Frank Sheeran is and this relationship with Russ Buffalino. So you need that in there. And there's a at one point they bring in uh, this character called Joey the Blonde and. Uh, when he was introduced, I'm like, oh, yeah, we could probably cut his stuff out. But then he's only in it for, like, five five or ten minutes, and the stuff that he's in there for is actually really interesting. So, I honestly, the, the time on this didn't bother me at all. A good movie is a good movie. As long as there's no wasted time in there, I don't think it should really be a problem. I and, think I think I just like Endgame better than this, so that's probably why I'm okay with the three hours. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. It's, it's a good question you... So you don't like cinema. (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) Yeah. For those who don't know, uh, Martin Scorsese is kind of against the superhero genre because he says it's, quote, not cinema. I think think he was taken out of context a a, a little bit. He did say that, but I don't think it was as harsh as what people are making out to. Francis Ford Coppola is the one who's really (laughs) Yeah, he really doubled down on it, but yeah. Okay. But anyways... (laughs) Um, so yeah, I, I don't think like the time is, is really an issue with this movie. Yeah. How did you feel, you know, watching it in the theater the first time versus like watching it at home? Did you have any difference like, oh, I'm really glad I saw it in the theater or it didn't really bother me watching it later at home? I am, did you have any different perspective between the two? I am really happy I saw it in theaters because I liked the, just having the big screen and I like the theater atmosphere and just kind of being there and sitting there, no breaks. You just watch the movie from start to finish. That's how I like watching movies. So I, I'm very happy I was able to see in theaters because it was limited release because it's with Netflix. So all the big, you know, Marcus or AMC theaters weren't releasing it. Luckily, there was a, a theater on the east side of Madison that was showing it. So I was happy I was able to see it. Mm-hmm. I just think when you watch it at home, it's tough because you kind of you can get it in the back of your head like oh, I could just pause this and go make dinner, or you know yeah, go, like go do drink, this. Yeah. Go and then next thing you know, it's like a half hour later, and then you gotta come back, sit down, and try to remember like what was going on in the movie. So I prefer the theater mm-hmm. atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Do you know why? Scorsese went forward with a Netflix production instead of like a yeah. major studio. Yeah, production. no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that because, up. Because, and, and the reason I'm asking is, yeah, he's he's pointing it out, but kind of with these caveats, like, yeah, I mean, it's on Netflix, but, like, watch it on the biggest screen possible. Yeah. And, hey, if it's in the theater, watch it in the theater. So I guess I'm kind of curious yeah. why it wasn't, like, a major studio production. No, I'm glad you brought that up. That's something I wanted to talk about. So uh, Netflix was the only studio that was willing to pay for this movie and put up the budget it was a, it's a 160 million dollar budget which is enormous most of it is for the effects the de-aging and everything and marty i mean as big of a name as he is maybe the biggest name in hollywood for directing uh he, all the studios that he brought this movie to said no they weren't going to do it they didn't want it to be three and a half hours long and they didn't want to put up the budget for it so he got turned down by everyone. Netflix was the only one who kind of came to him and said, it can be whatever you want, here's the money. So that's why it was done on Netflix, and I think, I don't know this for sure, obviously, because I don't know Martin Scorsese, uh, personally. I wish I did, that'd be cool. Um, but I think part of him probably didn't love the idea of partnering with Netflix. One of his best friends is Steven Spielberg, who's been known to he's publicly saying he doesn't want movies that streaming services put out included in award ceremonies yep. uh and and that's one of marty's best friends so i th- i would think that he probably it wasn't ideal for him to do this because he is all about movie like preservation cinema all that stuff so very he, traditional yeah like he wants stuff. people to see them in theaters so i think I think he was kind of just cornered into having to use Netflix to get this movie out there. But while you're right, he was advocating people to go see in theaters if possible, because I think ideally that's where he wants people to see it. You know what I just realized? What? We're talking about all this spy and gangster stuff. This is episode 007. Oh, hey. (laughs) (laughs) 
Good thing we talked about the bomb trailer today. That's so stupid. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Very true. I, I'm I'm looking at our uh, little counter here yeah. for our recording. And it says episode zero zero seven. I'm like, oh my god, here's all the spy, <laughs> gangster, con man movies we're yeah, talking about today. Perfect. Anyway. But yeah, so that's why it was with Netflix and why it wasn't in theaters because theaters won't put like Netflix stuff in their mainstream yeah. ones. Except so. like limited like yeah. extremely limited release yeah. kind of things because that that happened with roma last year yeah and that's it's kind of a give and take because uh alfonso Caron was actually happy to partner with netflix because it, in a similar way to the irishman like not a lot of people wanted to make roma and not a lot of people were willing <laughs> because it wasn't a good movie i did not like it was a good movie. movie but it was just <laughs> yeah anyways <laughs> um but not a lot of people wanted to make Roma or, or make it a mass release, so he used Netflix as a way to get it into people's living rooms and on people's TV screens. He was less concerned with the he wants people in the theaters aspect. He was just happy to get people to see it. So what score would you give this? Actually, maybe I should give mine first. I feel like you're going to be disappointed, but I gave this one an 8.3. Like I said, I I think it was hitting on all cylinders in terms of uh, the acting, the set design, costumes, all that sort of stuff. I really liked how everything came together. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, it's just, it's not my type of movie. It was so heavy on the dialogue that I, one, I'm glad that you saw this once before and kind of knew more about Jimmy Hoffa and who he was and who some of these people were because it I got lost a number of times so it, yeah and like I said we we kind of broke this up into four different parts and part three for whatever reason to me was just like super super confusing so I kind of went through like bits and pieces where I'm like yeah I feel like this is really plugging away really well and then I all of a sudden I'm like what I have no idea what's going on like I don't remember who they're talking about anymore and it's funny because they make jokes like everyone's named Tony. And yeah, there are a few times where I'm just like, who is this person? They all look the same. <laughs> so uh, that that's probably why I dropped my score a little bit. But uh, yeah, so I give it an 8.3 out of 10. How about you? 9.3 out of 10. Okay, okay. What uh, nominations do you see happening for this movie? I would definitely say Robert De Niro for acting... Joe Pesci as well. I just, I think, I think he was so good. I would say hair and makeup. I mean, I don't know. Did, did all, do you know, did all of the, like, effects they did with, like, the different ages, was all of it computer generated? Was some of it, like, physical prosthetics? Do you know? I don't think there are any physical prosthetics. I think... I'm not, I guess I'm not 100% sure, like, confident enough to answer that. Yeah, because I, I mean, regardless, I think, like, the hair and makeup, all that stuff was really well done. So, yeah, probably some of the technical things. I, I never know how to judge, like, cinematography or film editing, so maybe you have a better insight film on editing. that. Film editing is fantastic in this movie. It's, Scorsese, I can't remember the, their name, but he's been using the same editor for almost his entire career, and... His movies always have amazing editing and some of the examples. He He's really good at the show, don't tell thing in movies where it's better to show something happening than just say it is. So in this movie, there's a lot of that that happens where they talk about a character who died and then they'll do a quick edit to a car exploding and then they'll cut back to yes, their conversation. Yeah, so yeah. stuff like that, I love. And mm-hmm. th- that happens a lot in this movie. So I think it'll get nominated and possibly win for editing yeah uh but i have i mean it's gonna get nominated for best picture marty's gonna get nominated for best director yeah there's a good yeah. chance he's gonna they're gonna win both all three of the main actors are gonna get nominated i hope for sure de niro and probably Pe- pacino for sure because he's got a flashier role as jimmy hoffa i hope pesci does he should get nominated I would uh, love to see that. Th- yeah. Those two would be in a supporting role, whereas De Niro would be a uh, lead. And then editing, I mentioned. I could see that, you know, costume design, you kind of mentioned just because it's a period piece that takes place over three decades. And, you know, usually movies like that will get a costume design nomination. 
Writing, it's based on a book, so I could see this getting nominated for writing as well. For an adapted screenplay, yep, right? It's Since adapted. It's based on an existing work. Yep. So yeah, I think with that we could probably move on into kind of the breakdown that features more spoiler section unless there was anything you wanted to talk about. No, I think we can move into that. Okay, so yeah, for anyone who hasn't seen The Irishman, which at this point it's on Netflix, so there's really no excuse to see it if you want to see it. Uh, Skip ahead uh, if you haven't and you don't want to listen to spoilers. Uh, So yeah, The Irishman, as we said, is three and a half hours long, but it... It opens up with Frank Sheeran. He's uh, an old man in a like a home. You know, he's talking to someone we don't know who, and he starts describing his life. And uh, early on in his life, he's a truck driver for a meat company, uh, so he's part of the Teamster Union. He uh, gets involved with Russ Buffalino, and because like what what time is, is this? Like the fifties ish? Yeah, I think 60s? I think it's the fifties. So he he kind of tries to get in with the the mafia, the local Philly. This takes place in Philly mafia. So he starts sneaking them some some meat, uh, basically stealing it and giving it to them. But he gets caught. So he meets Ray Romano, who's a teamster lawyer, and he gets him uh, acquitted of all charges. He doesn't get in trouble at all. That's when Bill Buffalino introduces Frank Sheeran to Ross Buffalino, played by Joe Pesci. And that's when the, the relationship starts. So he kind of slowly starts doing these little odd jobs for, for Russ, who's uh, high up in the Philly Mafia, who's headed by Harvey Keitel's character, Angelo. And eventually it, he starts being a hitman for them. So he ends up killing people for them. There's this montage of him like throwing guns into the river that he uses during his like hit jobs. And... So after uh, being in their good graces for a while, Frank Sheeran gets introduced to Jimmy Hoffa, played by Al Pacino, because Jimmy Hoffa and and the Mafia have a relationship because Jimmy Hoffa, as the head of the Teamster Union, has access to like a billion dollars in pension because it's the largest union in the, in the country. And so the Mafia kind of use him as kind of a loan, like a bank, to fund things because they can't go to traditional banks so that they have a relationship there. So over the course of the movie, Frank Sheeran builds this relationship with Jimmy Hoffa, but then he also has this relationship with Russ Buffalino, and the two end up going at odds because uh, Jimmy goes to jail, and when he comes out, he wants his old position as the president of the Teamster Union back. But it's been filled by someone who, like, just is willing. He's always giving money to the mafia, no question. Whereas Jimmy would kind of press a little bit more because he wanted to protect that pension. But Jimmy wants his old position back, but the mafia doesn't want to get doesn't want to give it to him because they like kind of having this free bank with with his replacement. And it kind of comes to a head towards the end of the movie. Because uh, Jimmy Hoffa is kind of this hothead character, which is why I think it's perfect for Al Pacino. Yeah. Because he kind of, he gets, Al Pacino has kind of been criticized late in his career for being like an over actor. So this was a good role for I him think to, so. to be in. Yeah, I think so. I've heard some people say they didn't like it because it's too obvious and they wanted Al Pacino to try something different. But I'm like, this is perfect for him. Jimmy yeah, Hoffa no, is it, a, it, a... It fit perfectly. Yeah, so I think it was perfect for him. But it kind of comes to a head when, uh, towards the end of the movie, Al Pacino or Jimmy Hoffa starts threatening the mafia, saying, hey, I know things about you guys. I uh, I have these papers. I know more than you think I know. He's basically trying to blackmail them, which is never a good idea. So uh, throughout this movie, there's a couple flashback parts, and overlaying scenes or se- uh, scene or scenes in this movie is... Frank Sheeran is driving Russ Buffalino when they're older in life to a wedding, to uh, Bill Buffalino's daughter's wedding. As they're going from Philly to Detroit for this wedding, uh, Frank is calling Jimmy saying, hey, we need to meet, we need to make this good and, and everything. And uh, they set up a meeting for, for Jimmy, Russ, Frank, and then a couple other characters to get together and kind of work out their differences. So they get this meeting set up in Detroit, 
and uh, Frank and Russ are still outside of Detroit. And Russ has this scene, which I think was phenomenal, with Frank, where it's like they're at breakfast, and basically Russ is telling Frank, we're not going to go to Detroit right away, or the girls are going to hang back, we're going to go to an airport, you're going to fly up, and then you're going to come back three hours later. So they're they're not saying what's going to happen, but they kind of know what's going to happen. So basically, Frank flies up to Detroit meets with Jimmy, kills him, and then flies back down to Russ and, and their wives to drive up to Detroit, basically, so he has an alibi. He can say he wasn't in Detroit, so he wasn't the one who killed him. And then they they drive up to Detroit and attend the wedding. And then the third act, the last hour, is really years and years after, kind of how all these people involved in this never told anyone, but they all get go to jail for different things, but miraculously the secret never got leaked out, and that's why the Hoffa death has always been a big mystery. Uh, so uh, it, it's the reason I like it, and I'm fine with it being three and a half hours, is because you build this, re- you can see this relationship build between Frank Sheeran and Russ Buffalino, and also with Jimmy Hoffa. So by the end of the movie, when you realize that Frank has to kill Jimmy, like you feel more emotion towards it because you've just sat and watched them build this relationship for three hours. So it's a lot more emotional. Mm -hmm. And then even after that, when they show Russ in jail, when they're very old and he, he ends up passing away. Like you just, you feel those emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you know that I don't know if there's anything else I can, I can add to that. That was a, a great, breakdown of kind of how how the movie goes what were uh what were some of your favorite parts of the movie one of my favorite parts was towards the end when frank is uh it's way towards the end so this is more like as close to the present day as the movie gets and he's talking to these i think they're police officers or maybe they're with the fbi yeah i was gonna ask you who they were exactly because i thought they were maybe uh, detectives or attorneys or something i would think it would be something more federal or something because it's Jimmy. Sure. This is Jimmy Hoffa, but yeah, I like how they're asking him questions. He goes, "You have to talk to my lawyer," and they're like, "He's dead. Everyone is dead." Yeah, who but who are you? There's no one no, left to protect. There's which, no one left. Which did you notice throughout the movie? They would put up the names of some of these people, and when they died, yeah, it yeah, took it, it took me a little while to realize like why were they were doing that, but it's just to show that no one is alive anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone who is involved in this is dead. There's no reason to protect anyone anymore. Yeah. So I thought that was... I liked that part. I, I, I did, too. I actually made a note on that scene. Because, um, yeah, it, it was fascinating, too. Because, yeah, they're asking him about it. And they say, like, everyone's dead. There's no one left. And he's still like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not saying anything. Yeah, you're not going to mm-hmm. get me to talk about jimmy or anything so Mm. move along so you know even after all this time it's something that he's not he's not gonna talk about Mm -hmm. i i like that scores he kind of this movie he's done a lot of mob or mafia movies in the past before but this one really shows how lonely that life can be sure or unglamorizing it can be because you know, a lot of people, I think, when they think mafia movies, they think, oh, you're kind of living the, the party life, you're an important guy. It's kind of like Goodfellas, the beginning of Goodfellas, there's a, it's Henry Hill as a kid who, like, he wants to be in the mafia because they're the cool people, you know? Uh, whereas this movie is more like, you can see how lonely someone can get because... You, you, you gotta have, keep your mouth shut. Yeah, and you have to. You have do, to distance yourself from certain people. Yeah. Like he had to distance himself. I mean, he had a terrible relationship with his kids. Yeah, with or, Peggy it, especially. Yeah, his daughter Peggy. Or or he has to kill people he cares about. Yep. Uh, but yeah, since you brought up Peggy, what I was gonna say is, so Anna Paquin plays like the more adult version of her. Some of the criticism that's come up lately is. Uh, that she's probably got one of the bigger female roles in it, but she has five lines or five says five words in the entire movie, and there's some people who have had a, who have a problem with that. I, I get the criticism from okay, there 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 are no women in this movie. There's no people of color. They don't have many lines. I get that, but at the same time, I 
I thought she was so good. Yeah, well, the whole point of it, like I was saying, is loneliness. Like, she's there as, like, someone who's always seen what's happening, but she doesn't talk because she doesn't have a good relationship with her dad. That's the whole point. Yeah, so, I mean, her, her acting comes from more of her emotion and her presence than yeah. from actually saying anything. One of the last things I wanted to bring out, bring up was, what did you think of the de-aging in this movie? Were you bothered by it? No. The only thing that bothered me is, uh, I think Robert De Niro was wearing blue colored contact lenses, and it drove me nuts. Yeah, that's actually, that's because they did that, because actually some people have an issue with, like, he's playing an Irishman, but, like, he played an Irish person in, um, Goodfellas. So it's not like it's something he hasn't done before, but people just think of him from the Godfather Part Two, and it's like, you've played Italian roles before, and now you're an Irish person, but yeah, whatever. I mean, I know there's, uh, overall, the, the de-aging didn't really bother me. I don't think it was fantastic, because it's just, maybe it's because I've seen movies of Al Pacino when he was in his... 30s and 40s, and Robert De Niro in his 30s and 40s, so I just know they didn't look like what yeah. they looked like in The yeah. Irishman. But it served its purpose. Uh, there, you, you can tell that they're a little older than <laughs> what they're made to look like. I know that shopkeeper oh scene. Gosh, that's... Every, everyone brings it up, but you caught it right away, too. <laughs> like, I went upstairs for a second when that scene happened, and when I came back downstairs, your response was... Uh, you just missed the worst fight scene in movie history. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, this is when uh, Peggy is young and I don't even remember. She she knocked something over at the grocery store or something and the store owner, you know, pushed her out of the store or something. So Frank comes home and his wife's saying, oh, yeah, you know, Peggy got pushed out of the store. And he's like, what? Oh, my gosh. She's like, Peggy, we're going down there. And he, like, throws the grocery store owner through this super cheap ass looking fake glass window i'm just like oh god that was bad well whatever fine it's movie glass i get it and then he's it might have like, been cg it might have like, been fake glass might have been cgi he's like stomping on him slash kicking him in the face and i know we saw martin scorsese on was it jimmy <laughs> just, fallon i think and it was kimmel it may, yeah that's what i meant jimmy kimmel and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, we even, we, we had a posture stunt <laughs> yeah. double. Like, we, we had people, different stunt doubles just to, like, stand there I think for it was, Robert I De Niro when he was, like, his I don't think they characters. were I don't think they were stunt doubles. They were just, like, coordinators to, like, tell the actors to keep their posture oh, in line. okay. I don't think they were doubles. I, I, okay, I thought he said they were okay, doubles. Okay, I don't know. One of us is right, one of us is wrong. But I anyway, know. I was just thinking, okay, we need someone staying in for Frank to be kicking the crap out of this guy because yeah, this looks terrible. That's one where it's, yeah. I, that's. Do you think it would have been better if they would have just had a different cast as the younger roles? No. Okay. No. I, I, I like that they stayed with the same actors for the whole thing. I mean, Robert De Niro's... But like, I, I think maybe they could have had someone doing a better job yeah, kicking this guy. Like, that's like the one scene to have an actual younger person doing just either have the face turned away from the camera so you don't see De Niro's face or like just CG his face on there and it'll still look better. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that scene was not great. There, And there's a couple other times where you can kind of tell that they just move like they're older and it's just something that I don't think you can do much about. Yeah, so, I, I don't think it was super distracting or anything. No. Really, it was just that one scene with the grocery store owner that caught my attention. The rest, the rest of it, I thought it was really well done. Mm -hmm. uh, last question. How would you rank the three main performances of De Niro, Pesci, and Pacino? How would you rank how good they are? Like, one, two, three. I would say, maybe this is the order you just said it, uh, De Niro, Pesci, and then Pacino. Mm, I'm the exact opposite. Okay. I put Pacino number one. I think he was the best uh, in his role as Jim. I mean, part of his Jimmy Hoffa is a little more hot headed and he's a little flashier of a role. Kind of uh, like we were saying with like Ken Miles versus Carol Shelby. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Different roles. And yeah. I think he's one, one A, and one B would be Pesci. I think those two are just so close. Like, I wish they could both win the Oscar. Yeah, I, I don't know what Pesci it was about. Just, 
yeah, Joe Pesci, he was just, he was so enthralling. Like, every time he was on screen, like, yeah, I just, was, I couldn't. I'm so happy he came out of retirement it was for so this. Because his roles are usually the hot-headed person. Like, in Goodfellas, he's the crazy guy who's willing to hit someone in the head over with a bat or something. And this, he's so reserved and collected, and he's kind of... Still, still, like, calculated. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, and just a more, like, focused, mm-hmm. like, quieter yeah, he's... manner. Yeah, He's so good. I if either of them win Best Supporting Actor, I'll be happy. I kind even though I said I like Pacino's acting more, like I kind of want Pesci to win just because he came back for this movie. Yeah. But yeah. then, and I'm not saying De Niro's bad, but he'd be three for me, and it's not because it was a bad acting. He should still get nominated for it, but I just think the other two roles were that good. And De Niro, I mean, it should be no he's in most of this movie. There aren't a lot of scenes without him, so he had to carry it. And, yeah. You know, so, I mean, he still did a fantastic job. All three of, this could be all three of their best performances of all time. And they're all, really in this, you know, all in the same movie. I, I always really appreciate people who have long acting careers who continue to perform so well yeah. later in their career. And that's, it's just, I, I love that's, that. I'm, I love seeing... Clint Eastwood do well in yeah. in his later roles. I love seeing Meryl Streep. Um, yeah. um, don't do that. I love seeing Meryl Streep, Helen Mirren, like with these, you know, these these cool like these fascinating roles that they like still continue to mm-hmm. deliver. Yeah, and I that's why I'm happy because I agree with you. I'm happy they didn't do a younger cast for the uh, the younger days of their <laughs> lives because. I loved seeing Robert De Niro in a leading role, like a good leading role again, because he's done all the, like some bad comedies like uh, Dirty Grandpa or uh, <laughs> you know some movies like that. That even I mean even like The Intern. Like, yeah, like, that was a I good know you movie. liked it, but it isn't like the movies we're used yeah, to with De Niro yeah. because I, the last time he had been he's been nominated for leading actor at the Oscars it was 1991. That was his last nomination. For leading actor. Okay. Cape Fear. He was nominated for supporting for Silver Lining Playbook. Oh, yeah. But, like, it's just nice to see him in a leading... Because I think it's just tough when you... Obviously, when you get older in life, even as an actor, there just aren't as many roles for that age group. Like, in big, epic, leading, you know, see? movies. Marty's getting older. He yeah, wants to write. His friends with there him. you go. Uh, which which I think is awesome. People so, people write. People produce what they know. Yeah, so I'm. That's why I'm happy that he was in this movie from start to finish, and I think it was a fantastic role and job by him. Any final parting thoughts on Irishman? No, other than I would still recommend people to try to just watch it in one sitting. I know. You watch or we watched it and chunks of it. Mm-hmm. I even talked to someone at work earlier today who they're like, I trust your opinion. How should I watch it? I'm like, if you can, just watch it in one sitting. That's how it should be watched. It's the winter. The sun sets at like four o'clock. So I'll just take a few hours and yeah. sit down and watch it in one piece. And it's like yeah. people are complaining like on social media about the, the length of time in this movie. I know clearly I've said that is an issue for me. Then just don't don't watch it. Like it's yeah. on Netflix. Yeah. Just if turn if that's it off. really your biggest don't complain about it. Turn off then Yeah. Literally turn it off. Um yeah, I think the the final thing for me, the like we said, chapter four, kind of the end of the movie when uh Frank's in his assisted living facility. It was really fascinating to see him sit down with uh like the chaplain or the priest that they had there on site and talk to him. He's like, Do you do you feel sorry for the things that you've done? And he basically said, no, I, I don't feel sorry. I have no remorse. I didn't get to know these people's families, so I don't really feel bad for the families. And it, yeah, it was an interesting ending because you do see a little bit of Frank's softer side, but also know that, yeah, I mean, he was just kind of a machine through a lot of this. He put his emotions to the side yeah. and just carried things out. Yep. Yeah. As they need to be done which in was, his eyes. Which was set up with an early war scene with him where he just, he'll get things done. Yeah. That's like his attitude. Yep, exactly. So that closes up our discussion on The Irishman. Let's move on to this week's Best Picture winner, which is The Sting from 1973. Yep, and this is a personal favorite of mine. 
this I remember this is one of the first movies that I saw when I would go to my dad's house and he would pick out like once a week he would pick out a like an old quote unquote older movie to watch and this is one of the first ones that we watched and yeah I just this is my score will be indicative of it's a little biased because this is just a personal favorite of mine a little um some nostalgia bias, there for yeah you. yeah for sure but it's a con movie it's about a bunch of con artists a little mob mafia thrown in there as well but I've seen this movie countless times. What did you... So, uh, our main characters here, we've got Robert Redford playing Johnny Hooker, who's kind of like this grifter. Yeah, he's like a low-level con man. Yes, this... exactly. Yep. And we also have Paul Newman, who plays Henry Gondorf. And so the two of them kind of work together on this con. We also have Robert Shaw, who plays... Here we go, another Irishman. Yep. <laughs> but he plays uh Doyle Lonigan. Yep. Who's like a n- big time New York uh mob, like head of the mob out of New York. Yeah. Cuz most of this movie takes place in Chicago. Mhm. So those kind of that's kind of our, our our big players here. We've got and Robert Redford usually went as Hooker in the in the movie they kind of called him Hooker and then we've got Gondorf and Lonigan. Yep. This movie was directed by George Roy Hill, who uh, he had also directed just a few years earlier, did Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which also had Robert Redford and Paul Newman. So kind of a uh, another project for the three of them together. So this movie was nominated for 10 Oscars, which is a huge number, and it took home seven wins, which I think is really impressive. I think... I think six, once you get to like six wins, that's when it's like, oh, that's a big deal. Even five is a lot, but I think six is kind of when you start going, oh, that's a lot. All right. Yeah. So um, I'll just go through kind of the the more interesting pieces from their wins. So obviously it won Best Picture. The cool thing about that is uh, included with the producers is the first woman to win. Uh, with the best picture, which was Julia Phillips. So I thought that was really cool. We also have, they won uh, best costume design, and that was done by Edith Head. And, you know, when I was looking through all the wins, I'm like, Edith Head, like, why Why do I know that name? And I kind of looked into her, and there wasn't anything glaringly, like, okay, yeah, I definitely know her from this or that. But, you know, I found out that she is the most honored woman at the Academy Awards. She has 35 nominations. She has eight wins. I think on her IMDb page, she has over 500 costume credits. Yeah. She's just unbelievable. She worked on, um, uh, she was nominated for costume design in 19 different Best Picture winners. Yeah, she's, that's a name, I don't know anything costume design related, but that name I recognize all the time. Yeah, just crazy. And actually the costume department at, Paramount uh, Picture Studios is named after her. Oh, rightly so. I didn't know that. That's <laughs> yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and then it also won for Best Music, um, which was done by Marvin Hamlish. And I always, this has nothing to do with the prowess of how amazing Marvin Hamlish is, but I always think of uh, one of my favorite movies is Role Models. And the guy that plays Augie, he's always like, People always say, you look like a young Marvin Hamlish. To them, I say, who the fuck is Marvin Hamlish? And they go, oh, he did the music for The Sting. That's a great movie. It's a great movie. (laughs) And I remember one of the first times you and I watched that movie together, and you're like, yeah, that is a great movie. So I always think of that scene when I hear Marvin Hamlish. But uh, the guy's amazing. He was the youngest ever accepted into Juilliard. He was accepted at only seven years old. Amazing. He has the EGOT, which is... He has a win um, and an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. And he's one of only two people to have that and a Pulitzer Prize. The guy is amazing. So, um, and we'll we'll play the theme from The Sting at the end of the episode here. But you hear it and it's so iconic. Yeah, that's one of those recognizable Just ones. Just instantly recognizable whether you've seen the movie or not. You know the song. So, out of the seven wins, I just wanted to point out a few of those kind of cool things. Mm-hmm. And this was Robert Redford's only acting nomination. I know that. Really? Yeah, he didn't didn't win, obviously, but this is only acting nomination. He won. He's been nominated for director a couple times for Quiz Show, 
and he won for Ordinary People, which also won Best Picture in 1980. But yeah, only acting nomination. He almost got nominated for that, the one I watched recently, All Is Lost. I think that's what it's called, where he's on a yacht and it slowly starts sinking in the middle oh, of the ocean. Oh, yes. He got nominated for a Globe and maybe a Screen Actors Guild Award, too. So a lot of people thought he would get nominated for an Oscar for that, but it didn't end up happening. Yeah. But... So why don't you run us through yeah. kind of the basic gist of yeah, the movie, we'll, of the con. We'll go through a quick uh, yeah, synopsis summary or breakdown of this movie. So it opens up in Joliet or in the Chicago area during the Depression era, the 30s kind of, uh, time period-ish, I want to say. Yeah, I, th- I want to say the opening says it's like 1930. Yep, so it opens up on... This collector who, uh, he's collecting the kind of the this money for the small racketeering operation that's part of the bigger Lonigan operation. So he's collecting $10,000 to kind of bring up, uh, to deliver it to another location to kind of send it off to Lonigan. That's when Johnny Hooker, played by Robert Redford, uh, and then another character, Luther, show up and they kind of con him out of the money in a f- scene that I think is really funny and it's works so really genius. well. Yeah, yeah, it's like a small time con, but they don't know how much money is on this guy. They just kind of go, they just randomly pick him and go into him. So they end up conning him out of that $10,000 and uh, word gets up to Lonigan that some grifters took ten grand from this guy. So he orders a hit out on the people that were involved in it. So while uh, Johnny Hooker is kind of around town, he's getting harassed by this local cop played by Charles Durning. I can't remember the cop's name. I don't remember either. Look it up maybe while I'm talking. Uh, But while he's kind of out on the town being harassed by this cop every once in a while who he gives counterfeit money because he lost all the money that they got from the con already, uh, Luther gets... Uh, killed by the the hitmen that Lonigan hired out, and before he had died, Luther had given Johnny Hooker. Luther had given Johnny Hooker uh, Paul Newman's character Henry Gondorf's name to him to kind of, because Luther's retiring. This was like his biggest score, so he's like, I'm done. Here's Henry Gondorf's name. Look him up. So after Luther dies. Uh, Hooker goes to find Gondorf in one of, in my opinion, the greatest introduction scenes of all time. He meets uh, Henry Gondorf. He walks into his room that he's staying in. There's nothing there. No one there. So he starts to walk out and all of a sudden he hears snoring. (laughs) And he looks at the bed and there's no one in the bed. So he kind of looks along the side and wedged between the bed and the wall is uh, Henry Gondorf with, like, his nose pressed up against the wall, and he's just snoring, and it's hilarious, and he, he puts he, him in the shower. Yeah, and throws him in the bathtub and turns the shower <laughs> Yeah, on. and he's just sitting scene. there, and Henry Gondorf's like, hey, turn it off, turn it off, and Hooker doesn't do anything, so Gondorf leans up, turns the shower off, sits back down, and goes, glad to meet you, kid, you're a real horse's ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it, I just, I love that intro. But anyway, so they, they agree to... For revenge on Luther, they're going to pull this big con on Lonigan. So they they uh, get the usual suspects together. They round up the, the big crew to kind of decide how they're going to go after them. And uh, one thing I love about this movie is they have those old school title cards for like different chapters of the movie. Yes, I thought that was really cool. So the, one of the first ones is called The Tale. So it's... Uh, it's, that's like the chapter where everyone gets together and they're figuring out what con to play on Lonigan. Uh, they decide on The Wire, which is like a horse racing con. Uh, and then the next part, of the title card, is The Setup. So it's them renting out a building to build this bookie area out where Lonigan will go and think it's an actual racetrack bookie uh, to fool them. So it's them hiring out a bunch of workers or guys to work on the con on a smaller level and they're going to rent out this building and all this stuff. And then uh, they do the setup. Or no, I'm sorry, this is where they do the hook. Where it's where they hook in Lonigan, like where they reel him in and get him to get into the this con, which is a, a scene that's on the, a train because they're trying to, it's a funny scene where they're trying to figure out how to get to Lonigan. And uh, Gondorf is saying all these things like, oh, does he do this? Does he do this? And 
and one of their one of their associates is like, nope, doesn't do that alone, doesn't do this, and he goes, Jesus, does this guy do anything alone? He goes, plays poker. Yeah. And he cheats. Yeah, so <laughs> they mentioned yeah, whenever he he takes a train uh into Chicago that yeah, he has yeah, this poker game. Yeah, like, from New York to Chicago. Is yeah. there any way to get in on this? Yeah. So and I think the guy says, oh, if you show up with a lot of money and look like a sucker, you have a chance. So they get on the train. Henry Gondorf, he tips the the guy on the train saying, like, hey, like, you let me get in on this poker game. And he's like, all right, I'll see what I can do. And the the next part of this movie is probably my favorite part of the whole thing. It's it's hilarious, but it's smart and it just works. Where uh, they they pit pocket Lonigan and take all his money from him without him knowing it to kind of use their buy in to the poker game, uh, and then is Gond- that the best when you're just like you cheat someone just to cheat someone like yeah. like it's we're stealing your money just so we can get into this poker game to again steal your money. Yeah. Perfect. And and so Hooker and Gondorf are like on the inside of the con. They're playing different roles. Like Hooker's name is Kelly and Gondorf is I I can't remember, but he's like he, he's his boss. Either, like Gondorf yeah. is running this fake bookie like a uh, tavern where they're going to have the wire running and Hooker is like his number one man it, like in these roles that they're playing to fool Lonigan. But as they're getting ready to do this, uh, Gondorf is, like, purposely late to the poker game, so he's just hanging out in the, their, like, cabin on the train, and he's he's doing all these, you know, card tricks to kind of impress Hooker, and then he, like, messes up and, like, drops the deck, and Hooker looks at him like, are you okay? And he's like, I'll be fine, kid. You take care of your part. And he's also, like, dumping out a bottle of gin yeah, and he, like, filling dump- it up with water and, like, slashing it on his face yes. so he can smell like he's drunk. I love that part because, yeah, he dumps out, like, half of it, fills part of it back up with water, right? He's splashing it on himself. He's, like, sw- um, he's like swishing it in his mouth. Yeah, just spitting it out. Totally just give smell. off this, yeah, illusion that he's just drunk off his ass. Yeah, he's, and he says something. <laughs> Always drink gin with a mark, kid. They can, they'll never tell if you cut the deck or not. Uh... So it just sets up the the one of the greatest scenes of all time where uh, Gondorf is walking to the cabin where they're playing poker, and he like kind of stands outside the closed door and kind of does one last sigh. And he goes, "All right," and when he walks in, he just walks in and he goes, "Sorry, I'm late, guys. I was taking a crap." <laughs> like he just plays up this caricature of just being a rude drunk asshole, and he is hilarious in this scene. You, I would just from I want to hear your perspective from it because <laughs> you hadn't really seen this movie in a well, while. Yeah, so when we, uh, you know, first, you know, we every week we're we're drawing years out of a hat to watch a movie, and you were so excited, you're like, oh, Sting, perfect, so excited for this. And uh, I'll be honest, like the the first time around, I needed uh, a lot of help understanding what exactly was going on, but. Uh, we we rewatched this before the podcast just because I wanted to see it again and you know have it fresh in your mind. Yeah, to talk ex- about exactly. Stuff. And it's funny because this scene stood out to me more than anything, and it just it was one of those things like you're right. I mean, start to finish, it was so perfect and it was hilarious. Yeah, and it's just it's it, just it sticks with you. It's per- so it's, it's so good. Perfect Paul Newman, where he's just this. He messes up Lonigan's name the whole time yes. too. Like he, he never calling he, him like Litterman. Well, it's, it's something different every time, different, but it's never yes. Lonigan. And he just every time they cut back to him, he has like a different article of clothing off, or like oh, well, he's yeah, got his that, blazer that, on. That's and then part of it too. He he walks in, you know, all disheveled, and uh, uh, Lonigan's like, "Oh, in here we wear ties." And he's like, "I can get you one if you need." Like he says it jokingly, and then Connor's just like. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great, Lonaman. <laughs> he says by the wrong name. And he's burp, he always burps after yeah, it, too. Yeah, he, like, uses the, Oh, yeah, I love that. He, he uses he the sneezes, tie. He sneezes later on in the movie and then uses the tie that he had gotten from Lonigan as, like, a tissue or, or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, he's always calling him by the wrong name, but he keeps winning. Like, that's the thing. Like, he says, like, I, I got to win. That's the only way this works is he has to win this poker game. And he does. He keeps winning and winning and winning. And he keeps insulting Monaghan the whole time. And I, it's just hilarious. And then it gets to a point where uh, Lonigan's getting tired of it. 
So, uh, and it's known or established at this point that he cheats at poker. Lonigan does. Yeah. So they take so a ha- they take like a five minute break, and uh, one of his uh, associates says, uh, "All right, I'll fix the deck for you. We'll we'll make sure uh, he gets he is in Gondorf, but they don't know his name's Gondorf at this point. I can't remember what his fake name is, but anyways, we'll give him like four threes, and we'll give you four nines." And, and then, you know, then you'll, you'll clean them up at that point. So then, you know, they do one last hand. They kind of show how Lonigan switches the deck, which is kind of cool. But anyway, so they, what I love about this scene is they show both of their hands. So they show that, like, Lonigan has three, two nines or whatever. And they show that Gondorf has three threes. And they both, I'll take two cards, I'll take three. And they show that. Uh, Lonigan has four nines, like he planned, and they show, like they show it that uh, Gondorf has four threes or whatever it is, and they bet and they, you know, bet ten grand each or whatever, <laughs> and then I love it. So Gondorf calls Lonigan, so he's the one to show his hand first, and Lonigan goes four nines, <laughs> without cutting back to him and showing his hand again. Going Gondorf just goes. Four jacks, and it's like you'd seen his hand was four threes, and then they show a close up of the of his hand, and it's four jacks now all of a sudden. Yeah, and so it's like, like it's it's like a con on the audience yeah, too. So you're like, Whoa, yeah. I, what? That that's not what we expected. Yeah, as the like, audience. Like that's not what we saw. How, how did he how do did that? that happen? How did he do that? Uh, so, anyways, so he beats Lonigan. Uh, Lonigan has a funny line later on where where he's like talking to the associate who kind of stacked the deck who's like i know i gave him four threes and he must have cheated and lonigan's like well what did you want me to do uh tell in front of everyone else that he cheated better than i did (laughs) so anyways like i know we talked about that scene for a while but i do i absolutely love that scene i think it's hilarious good scene so yeah that's 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 how they hook them them in and and they're like hey we we've got this come to our place we we do um like bets on horse racing. Yeah, well, Ke- Kelly is the one he meets Lonigan, and that Kelly is uh, Hooker, and Hooker kind of gives him this story of uh, I don't really like my boss. I want you to help me uh, clean him out so that I can take his place. Uh, so that yeah, they hook him into this con. The next uh, title card is just, is called the the Sting, and basically what the Sting is, they're trying to get. Uh, Lonigan to place like a half million dollar bet on a horse race and then uh, you know kind of con him out of that money and it's kind of cool they show they like test it a couple times where Lonigan just places like a thousand dollar bet to see if this works and what they're telling him is that they're post they're, they're posting the results where like they, they get where Hooker has his partner where he gets the results of the horse races, he works at the Western Union. He tells Hooker the winner of this race is this horse, and then waits a couple minutes for Hooker to place a bet, and and then Hooker is telling Lonigan to place the bet for him, and then they like rele- and then his partner releases the the results. That's the story they tell Lonigan, uh, and it's kind of funny they have to on the spot set up a meeting with this partner, which they didn't plan on doing with Lonigan, but he like insists on doing it. And it's kind of funny where they they just go into this random office, Western Union, a Western office, Union yeah. office. They just go in and they pretend that they have to paint the office, so they kick the actual guy out who whose office it really is. And then Lonigan comes to meet uh, one of the associates, and he tells them, "Oh, we can't meet here. I'm having the place painted." So they leave, and then the guy who is painting it just walks out the door. And then when the actual owner of the office comes in, he's like, "What the hell? It's like a half painted room." Yeah, that was yeah. kind of funny. But anyway, so. Uh, the con is like it works. They like they post, but uh, they do the bet. It works. But Lonigan's like, I want to do a, another test run, and they're like, Well, we weren't expecting this, so they kind of have to do a. They kind of have to on the on the ball, kind of mix it up a little bit, where they give Lonigan the horse to bet on, but they don't let him place the bet because they couldn't pay out the winnings because yeah. this is all fake. They couldn't actually pay out the winnings. Yeah, so, so like they have like an extra guy or two kind of like in line quick, to quickly, place a bet. yeah, getting from him in line. And then they go, 
oh, um, race is closed. Like, yeah. sorry, you can't place a can't bet. Can't place a bet. But then he sees that the name he got was the winner, so he believes that this system works, but yep. without having to place a bet. Mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, so, yeah, they're getting ready for the big con where uh, Lonigan's going to place a half a million dollar bet, and they're getting it all set up. Meanwhile, uh, that cop that's been you know, messing around with Hooker a little bit. His name's Snyder, where, like, Hooker gave him counterfeit money to kind of mess with him. Uh, he's meeting with the the FBI because the throughout the whole movie, they kind of note that the feds are after Gondorf. So Snyder, the co- local cop, meets up with the FBI, and they bring in Hooker to try to rat out uh, Gondorf. And he agrees to do it uh because they blackmail him to an extent so he agrees to do it so while this whole sting operation is going on uh the the feds are also kind of closing in on gondorf uh, because hookers kind of betrayed him a little bit and then it all comes to a head so at the end of the movie lonigan's waiting for the the horse that he has he's gonna bet on and he's been betting on all winners so far he takes the phone call the the guy says, uh, place your bet on whatever horse name it is. So Lonigan's like, okay. He goes, places his half million dollar bet to win, like for that horse to win the race. And then he sits down and and he starts talking to uh, the West, the fake Western Union guy that he met up with who's in on the sting, who is, who is on the other end of that phone call. And he's like, uh, yeah, don't worry, I bet that horse to win. And the guy looks at him and goes, win? No, I told you to place, place, which means second place you know for him to win and Lonigan goes oh no I messed up so he lost loses the bet you know they kind of trick him into placing it on this horse to win even though he doesn't so he loses the bet and then the feds show up and shoot Gondorf who shoots uh, a hooker because he realizes he betrayed him so now they're dead they're in front of Lonigan dead Snyder gets Lonigan out of there and then it's revealed that the feds were fake they were just in on the sting to because the whole they bring it up a couple of times in the movie. Their whole thing is you have to make Lonigan think that you're you're dead or that or not even know that you took his money, so he doesn't come after you. Yeah. So they do this whole Fed thing to so Lonigan doesn't come after him because he thinks they're dead, and then he doesn't even know that it was a sting because in his mind he just placed the bet wrong, so he lost the bet and lost his money. Yep, yep. And, uh, and, then, and so that's how the movie ends. They kind of reveal Hooker and Gondorf are, are still alive. They faked the shooting and everything. Uh, they weren't really feds. They were in on the sting. And then they start breaking down the, the building that they're in, and they kind of just walk off into the sunset. Yeah, and it's a perfect... They, they avenge Luther's death, and they pull off this huge operation against this big time guy mm-hmm. and yeah it was it was really exciting it's it's one of those movies where it's like it's you're you're rooting for the underdog even though they're kind of doing schemey things it's like no like you want them to get back at the guy who killed their friend yeah. so and uh, it's, yeah it's a great story it's one of the earlier it's so fun. yeah it's it's just a, yeah you said it, it's a fun movie i just love this movie uh they have a couple twists in there too which is one of the older movies I can think of that pulls off a couple twists. Like, Hooker has a love interest throughout the movie. Uh, and then she get, gets shot towards the end of it. And throughout the movie, you know that there's this assassin out there named Salino who's after Hooker because, you know, he uh, he's the grifter who worked with Luther to steal the money at the beginning of the movie. And then it's revealed that his love interest is Salino and the person that shot her was someone Gondorf hired to keep an eye out on Hooker. So there's a couple twists, the the Feds twist too. It was I don't know, it's just a really good movie. Uh we already went over the scenes that I really like, the train scene and and even that opening small con scene. The one of the only things I can say about this movie that maybe you can touch on that could have been better is this movie the first couple times i watch it it is kind of hard to follow you got to yeah. pay attention to everything that's happening otherwise you're going to get a little lost it's there's the, so at, many characters at you gotta the keep same it time it's one of those movies that like gets better every time you watch it yeah because yeah. it's like yeah you you pick you know what's coming and you pick up on those extra little things and yeah i feel like each time there's like a new detail that you didn't quite pick up on you're like oh my god they thought of everything yeah i even heard a rumor that because, you know, uh, four years earlier, Redford, uh, Newman, and this director, George Roy Hill, they had done Butch Cassidy together. 
well, they did this one together, obviously, but on the set, apparently none of the actors knew the plot of this movie because it was so confusing to them. <laughs> they just acted out whatever George told them to do <laughs> yeah. for the day. So that's like, that kind of goes in with, this can be kind of a hard movie to follow. But once you, I mean, once you understand it and you pay attention, I mean, I think it's just really fun. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully we summarize enough of what's going on so that when you go home and watch it, you got yeah. it. You There's, have to pick it up. Yeah, then there are other like B and C plots going on that we didn't quite touch on, but that's just more for for the, you the listeners to pick up on when you watch it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so in terms of score, I give this one an eight point six. Okay. okay. I think it was a really good movie. Yeah. I know you're. I I'm a tough critic. It's you are. Very you you had, hard. had one movie in the nines and it was a nine point oh. It was yep. very tough. It was very tough. What's a ten to you? Time. Like what's a movie that's a ten to you? Just out of curiosity. I don't know. I don't know if there is one. Oh, there has to be one. No, no. <laughs> there's 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 nothing that's perfect. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I I have in my mind what is probably like the best movie i've ever seen okay what score is that movie probably like 9.8 okay what was it an 8.8.6 okay yeah great movie i like i said i made the only reason why it's probably a little lower is that just yeah it's it's a little hard to figure out but the upside of that is every time you watch it like it's that much more fun Mm -hmm. that's all i got this is a 9.7 to me this is a near perfect movie to me. It's maybe a little confusing, but once you watch it, you know if if you pay attention the first time you see it, or maybe rewatch it, it's very rewatchable, and you can you'll understand more as you watch it. But it's a yeah, it's a near perfect movie to me. And again, some of this might be inflated because I watched it a lot as a kid, so yeah, I'm a little biased towards it. Yeah, but. that's reasonable though. Um, you know, and one thing, uh, I know some people listen and think oh can i watch this with my family so the movie's rated as pg they didn't have pg-13 when this came out i'd say maybe this is kind of on the edge of pg-13 like yeah. just with like i mean there's there's some blood some uh Not a lot. Shots yeah. and stuff, but it's it's all pretty mild so I, i'm okay with pg right like i know you said border pg-13 they don't really swear in this um yeah there's some intense scenes i'm trying to think what they would put on the green beginnings give it oh pg-13 for for this these reason. reasons yeah there there's no not really any swearing there's no like sexual content uh but like there's some you know drinking and stuff like that oh maybe pg it's yeah, in between it's, pg-13 and pg yeah there's really nothing too serious so yeah if you're looking for something uh nostalgic for your family movie night check out the sting so yeah, looking at the other 1973 nominees and winners in the big categories, I'm not going to rework these or anything because I haven't seen a lot of movies from this year, but I have seen some of these. So Best Supporting Actor was won by John Houseman for The Paper Chase. I don't know what that is. I'll be never honest. heard of him, never heard of the movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Good for him though, I guess. I guess. Uh, the... the the only other thing really worth noting in this category, Randy Quaid, I think this might be his only no- nomination. Cousin but, Eddie? Yeah, Cousin Eddie was nice. nominated for Best Supporting Actor for uh, playing Larry Meadows in The Last Detail. And this is a movie I've seen. I've actually seen it recently. It, it stars Jack Nicholson, who he was nominated for Best Actor for this movie as well. Where, uh, yeah, they play, like, Sailors in the Navy... And I think Randy Quaid's character is being um, court-martialed, and they have to bring him from, like, point A to point B, and it's kind of like a road trip kind of movie where they, you know, it's kind of, it's it's kind of fun. It's a good movie. Very young Randy Quaid. Yeah. It was one yeah, of his no first doubt. movies, I'm sure, and he got nominated for it. And now he's crazy, and I think in jail. Definitely crazy, yep. Uh, Best Supporting Actress was won by Tatum O'Neill. For Paper Moon. Is that I, when she was like a kid? Yeah, and right? I, I was going to say, I think she this is the youngest winner of all time. Anna Paquin was very young when she won her Oscar and bringing her up since she was an Irishman too. Yeah. But she was a kid too. Tatum O'Neill might be the youngest winner to win in like an acting Oscar. Maybe that's something to look into. Uh, Linda Blair was nominated for The Exorcist. Ooh. Uh, Madeline Kahn, also nominated for Paper Moon. Madeline Kahn, she's in a bunch of those uh, 
Albert Brooks movies. Mel Brooks. Why did I say Albert? Mel Brooks movies like Young Frankenstein and uh, Blazing Saddles. And yes, I just looked up. You are correct. Tatum O'Neill is the youngest uh, actor to win. Yeah, 11 she years 11 old. She's 11 years old. Crazy. And uh, so, yeah, Best Supporting Actress, 1973. Uh, Best Actress was won by Glenda Jackson. I've heard of her. I haven't seen too many of her movies. Uh, she won for A Touch of Class. And then uh, in Best Actor, Jack Lemmon won his second acting Oscar for Save the Tiger, which I've seen. That movie... Some I've never pe- heard of that. Yeah, some people say he actually shouldn't have won this year, and it was kind of like a makeup for not winning a previous year. I can't remember okay. what for. So he plays uh, the owner of uh, like a warehouse or a manufacturing plant, and he is broke. So the whole movie is him contemplating whether to like kind of set his building on fire and claim an insurance like fraudulently claim insurance on it uh so it is i've seen it he's good in it but yeah i don't know that one might be in question and marlon brando was nominated for last tango in paris which that movie's fairly controversial uh jack nicholson as i mentioned he was nominated for the last detail Robert Redford nominated for The Sting, like we mentioned. And then Al Pacino was nominated for Serpico, so another guy from The Irishman popping up. Which, I kind of had that one highlighted because Serpico, he plays a cop. who mm-hmm. He's like an undercover detective. Okay. And he uncovers a dirty cop ring. Ooh. And we saw 21 Bridges recently, which is similar to that. Uh, this is like maybe a better version of that. Because that movie, sure. he's fantastic. Like that, Serpico is one of his iconic roles uh and then uh, the last two categories best director won by george roy hill like we mentioned william fredkin probably saying that wrong was nominated for the exorcist bernardo bertolucci was nominated for last tango in paris he would eventually win for the last emperor Oh, okay. Uh, year, I was going to say, years later. that name sounded familiar, but yep. I didn't know why. Uh, and then George Lucas got his first uh, directing nomination for American Graffiti. Oh, okay. And then in Best Picture, Sting won, and then you noted Julia Phillips being the first female producer to win that award. Uh, Cries and Whispers was nominated for Best Picture. The Exorcist was nominated for Best Picture. Touch I it. did not know that was nominated for Best Picture. I've, I've yep. actually never seen The Exorcist. Okay, all right. That might be one that we'll have to watch sometime. Might have to throw that in there sometime. Yep. Touch of Class is nominated. And then American Graffiti was nominated, which American Graffiti is what, it actually has Ron Howard in it, but oddly enough, that's what inspired Happy Days. Because it's a movie no that... No way. It's a movie that takes place in the 50s, and it follows, like, teens in this town in the 50s. And it's what Does it take place in Milwaukee, too? I'm not sure. <laughs> um... But yeah, that's... Oh, that's great. I did not know that. Yeah, so that's what inspired Happy Days, and that's Ron Howard's in it. I think Francis Ford Coppola, yeah, he produced it. So Francis Ford Coppola, George Lucas working together, and uh, Harrison Ford is in that too. That's one of his first roles, and that's actually why George Lucas was hesitant to hire Harrison Ford on as Indy. Because oh, okay. he's like he's been in two of my movies. He sure. was he was in American Graffiti and he was in Star, Star Wars. Wars. Like I don't want to keep, but it, that ended up working out. <laughs> yeah, I think it turned out okay. Yep. So yeah, those are kind of the big nominees, winners of that year. And going into our last segment, you brought it up a little bit. Uh, so The Exorcist was nominated for Best Picture, but we wanted to try out a new segment where. If it correlates in with the one of the movies we're reviewing or some of the nominees, we're going to talk about different genres that maybe don't get represented that well at the uh, Academy Awards. And you said it, you know, you didn't think The Exorcist was nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, I just didn't know. Yeah, well, it was, and it's a horror movie, and I don't think horror movies really get nominated that often for Best Picture, so we're going to dig into that a little bit now. Yeah, what uh, what's kind of your perspective on maybe why horror films, quote unquote, scary movies don't get nominated? I think they're probably just viewed, and this is just me spitballing. I just think they're viewed as like slasher movies, so they're they're just not creative to the Academy. They're just viewed as these like B list movies that get pumped out, I guess. Yeah, and maybe 
Yeah, like the creativity is in a different way. Like we talked about um, the guy that does the monster makeup. I can never remember his name. I Rick Baker. Rick Baker, monster maker. You know, certainly there's like a different level of creativity. But yeah, I think maybe the thing that I feel like maybe sets these movies apart. And we talked about this when we discussed um, Saving Private Ryan versus Shakespeare in Love. And kind of our tiebreaker was... Does this movie like impact your view on the world? Does it kind sure. of change change your perspective? Does it does it add something? And I think a lot of times horror movies they're not as plot driven. They don't always kind of hey here's your message now take it and apply it to your life kind of thing. Yeah. So that that's kind of my thinking of maybe why these don't always get recognition. No, I think that's a great point, and that's you probably said what I was trying to say better than what I was saying because I was saying <laughs> oh I thank you <laughs> they're viewed as like slasher movies so there's not a lot of creativity there there isn't a lot of like plot there so like yeah, you cre- said there creativity in the, in there, the storytelling there maybe. isn't there isn't yeah like you said a lot of historical Im- like, importance in a lot of these movies but I mean I would argue to extent like there are some good ones out there, though. There and, are. And I don't think the good ones even get recognized. I don't know if it's just a stigma that they have, or it's just, oh, horror not happening, kind of like mm-hmm. comedy, where it's like, oh, comedy, whatever. Nah, 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 yeah, because I think a lot of times movies from those genres, I, I think they're seen as, like, relying on, like, tactics and gimmicks instead of, mm-hmm. like, more classical stuff. Yeah, and I think it irritates me more these days because recent well not even recently anymore it was like 2009 when this happened but the academy expanded the number of best picture nominees to up to 10 instead of just five and they did that in response to like the dark knight being as good as it is being a superhero movie and kind of an action movie and then you know the hangover came out a couple of years later when they had expanded it i'm pretty sure they had expanded the number of nominees at that point and I remember being upset that they didn't nominate, like, the Hangover. And I know we're talking horror right now, but I'm just using this as an example. That even now, they still don't give the cr- good notoriety to, like, a good horror movie. I think of a movie like Hereditary that came out a year or two ago. I yeah, mean, I think it was just last year, yeah. Yeah, and that didn't get nominated. There are some horror movies that got nominated, that have been nominated for Best Picture. Uh, that are a little loose. Uh, the Exorcist did, which isn't, but they have Jaws listed as a horror movie. Yeah. Which I get, but yeah. like that might not be what you think of. Silence of the Lambs they have as a movie, a horror movie that won Best Picture. Sixth Sense, yes. Black Swan, uh, yeah. I haven't yeah, seen. It's just kind of a psychological yeah. thriller, but... Eh. And then Get Out is classified as a horror movie, which Get Out, I'm glad they got the no- notoriety uh, as the Best Picture nominee. But that's where I think horror movies these days, they can't be traditional horror movies. They have to have, like, a bigger meaning behind them to kind of get that historical importance that you had talked about Mm -hmm. before. Uh, I don't know. I just... I don't know what it is, but I just... The Academy doesn't nominate these movies all the time. Okay, so what we're going to do is rank our top five horror movies. Yep, and I kind of... We left it up to interpret it. You can either just do your favorite five horror movies, which I think you did. Yep. Oh, and I kind of did maybe the five that should have or could have been nominated for Best Picture. Okay. I didn't... And I didn't, I'll, I'll be honest, I was loose on the term horror. That's fine. I kind of went with scary... That's fine. Scary oh, movies. That's fine. Because I, I might have gotten a little loose with some of mine, too. What is your number five? My number five... Is Final Destination Five? <laughs> Ooh, what? I I love the Final Destination movies. They well, we're definitely not a favorite on this because there's no way so, that's ever- <laughs> no they're they're so ridiculous, but in a way that almost makes it seem like it's possible. You know, like all all of these things are completely freak accidents, and you look at it and go. Freak accidents happen all the time. So it's one of those things where, like, you think, oh, my God, something like that might actually happen. Um, I mean, part of this, I think, just comes from 
this would freak me out anyway, but do you know how many people, like, specifically because of the Final Destination, we, like, refuse to drive behind cars that have, they're <laughs> carrying logs? Like, you yeah. know, like, shit like that. <laughs> See? It impacts you. Um, like, I remember, I don't even, they all jumble together, so I don't always remember which one is which, but, like, the one where the girl gets, like, fried in the tanning bed. Like, yeah. that came out when we were in high school, and I remember so many girls being like, oh, my God, I'm never going tanning again. And, of course, they did, but... You know, I like that it has the element of, like, well, that super random freak accident could possibly happen. But the reason I picked Final Destination 5 is because, spoiler alert, the end of that one is the plane crash that starts off the very first Final Destination movie. And I love that. I love that it, like, brings it back. So cool. I don't know. I love that. I saw that and I'm just like... Oh, I loved it. So, there know, we go. I know you love those movies. I think I've only seen the first two, where, like, the first one was interesting. It's a different idea. Uh, but then I think after that, they kind of just turn into what's the weirdest way we can kill people. Oh, yeah. And that's, I think that's my favorite part about it. All right. There you go. So, that's why it's number five on my list. <laughs> my number five I put on here, I feel like I had to because felt like it kind of redefined the horror genre to an extent, and that Scream. Nice. Okay. Because it kind of made fun of horror movies, but while having a good horror movie storyline within it. See, I, I, I have that on my uh, honorable mention. So, yeah, okay. definitely in consideration. Yeah, plus it's everyone knows it, too, like that ghoul mask and everything that's seen at the beginning with, I think, Drew Barrymore yep. on the phone. Uh, but it was just, it's a good horror movie, but while at the same time it kind of makes fun of the genre, and it just worked really well. And uh, while that spun off into a bunch of sequels and everything, I think that first one has to still be considered one of the best horror movies of all time. And, I can't and it remember. holds up really well. Yeah, I, we, we I had never seen it, and we watched it, yeah, a year or two ago. I'm like, wow, this, like, this is really good. Mm -hmm. So my number four is you were saying how the sting kind of has some nostalgic uh, value for you and it kind of upped your score a little bit. So I think that's the same with me in this next one. And my number four is The Others. Oh, I'm glad. Okay, I'm glad you had this because that's in my honorable mentions, but I've never seen it. I love this movie. The, um, in all the rankings that I was looking at to kind of put my own rankings together, that was up there on a lot of them. Yes. And, and I know, I think... totally surprised me because in my mind... I was a, what, I don't know, 10, 12-year-old kid. My neighbor and I watched it all the time. And it was just something, like, we liked it because it was kind of ridiculous. But, yeah, I was kind of surprised that a lot of people yeah. think it's a great horror movie. Yeah, and um, I think it had some Golden Globe nominations. Like, it, it could have legitimately gotten nominated for Best Picture. And I, I think the best thing about it is that it's it's got a great twist. And I always love that about horror movies. Don't, don't say it. I, I won't. Seen it yet. I won't. I'm not saying it. That that's all I'll say. It's like I I love the twist in this movie. So um, yeah, and it's one of those that um, I <laughs> I kept the VHS of that for the longest time, like literally until my parents moved out of their house that I grew up in, because I love that movie and I just. I wasn't right apart with it. And I I haven't owned it on DVD or I haven't seen it in a very, very long time. But yeah, the others. Yeah, we'll have to, my list. We'll have to watch we'll it. We'll have sometime. to watch it now. It's an eighty three percent on Rotten Tomatoes and a seven point six on IMDb. So yeah, that's I think that's a great pick. I, I wanted to put it on my list because I, I just I know it's considered a good movie, but I haven't seen it, so I didn't I didn't want to put it on there. Yeah. So what's your number four? My number four is Poltergeist. Okay. It's not my favorite movie. Yeah. And I just said it's a iconic, classic movie that I think it got some nominations anyways. I can't remember which ones exactly. But, um, but yeah, it came out kind of around the same time as uh, The Exorcist, and it was very popular in its time. It was actually written by Steven Spielberg, too. Uh, yeah. That, I don't know, it was, I've, I saw it recently in the last year or so. And, uh, I don't know, I just felt like it was one of those that could have been nominated for Best Picture. It had enough uh, popularity and steam behind it that I felt like it was it was a possibility. Yeah, good. My number three is the Amityville Horror. 
Which one? The if... Ryan Reynolds oh, okay. one. If we're talking scary movies, this is the scariest movie I've ever seen in terms of... This one kept me up at night. Mm. Like, I remember watching it, like, in the summer, during the day, because it was like, there's nothing better to do. And I watched this movie, and it stuck with me the rest of the day. I went to bed that night, and it freaked me out. Um, uh, Ryan Reynolds was just so creepy. And again, it's that... Because this is loosely based on potentially uh, real life events, that's the stuff that really like gets under my skin. It's like, oh my god, yeah. this happened to someone. That sort of thing. So, um, yes, this movie scared me so much. Uh, so that's why I have it on this list. Yeah, you kind of get if it's a kind of based on a true story that kind of ups the ante for you a little bit. Doesn't yeah. It? Um, one of my honorable mentions is Zodiac, specifically because of that. Ooh, it's, that's a good that's, one. That's not a horror movie. Yeah, but, I didn't even think of that one. That's That one is really But good. it's based on the Zodiac killer, a serial killer, and it's just one of those things like, oh my god, this happened in real life. This actually happened. And yeah, I mean, there are some scenes in there that are, um, like, get your blood pumping. So yeah, it, it sticks with you. Okay, all right. My number three is The Shining. Okay. So this was not very popular movie. Stanley Kubrick, Jack Nicholson, a lot of star power behind it. I think this is just a really good movie, and it just happens to be a horror movie, and I think this could have easily been nominated for Best Picture. It's a certified 85% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, it's one of Jack Nicholson's iconic roles. Oh, I don't yeah. even think he got nominated for it, um, but it's very quotable. Uh, you know, here's Johnny and everything. Have you ever seen The Shining? I've seen parts of it. Kind of like I've seen the scene of him, like, yeah, busting through the door. I'm just like, what the heck? This man is possessed. But I honestly, I think I haven't seen much more yeah. than that. They just came out with a sequel to it. Apparently, it's pretty oh, yeah, good. That's right. McGregor. Doctor Sleep. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that's mine. That's mine. I don't think I need to talk about The Shining too much. I think everyone knows what it is. Yeah. I, I think that's the top of the list. So, my number two is It from 2017. Mm. That is a fantastic horror movie. It was... It has, like, the perfect amount of jump scares. There's, like, some gore, but not, like, too much, where it's, like, off-putting. Um, it's it's creepy. There's, like, enough humor, like, lightheartedness, and... I think because it's kind of told through, like, the perspective of the kid, the kids, like, that always makes things a little bit scarier. Like, everything's scarier when you're a kid. Yeah. So, I, it was the right amount of scary and creepy, and, yeah, I just, I really loved it. Yeah, no, I, it's really good. That it, I like the first one more than the second one, for sure, too. Like, the, like, of the new, the new ones, movies yeah. that you're yeah. talking about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My number two is one I might have put a little higher on here because it's like a personal favorite of mine, but The Thing from 1982 with Kurt Russell. Oh, okay. I've never even heard of it. Yeah, this is uh, it takes place in Antarctica with like, a, a team that's stationed there with Kurt Russell and a couple yeah, other people freaky. there. And this dog, this guy chasing a dog enters the camp and he's trying to kill this dog. And so they, I think they take him out because they're like, who's this crazy guy? And it turns out this dog is actually an uh, alien that can take the form of whatever it touches. Whoa. So it's in the form of a dog. And there's a bunch of creepy, so this was made by John Carpenter, and the effects in this are awesome because they're kind of practical. So kind of with the Rick Baker thing, where it's uh, when we talk about him, it's I like practical effects versus CG. They they hold up better. Yeah, well, they're just physically there. So yeah, I think as they age, it's like you know it's a little better. But there are scenes where like the first scene when this dog morphs into the thing, and it just it looks like kind of a blob to a certain extent. And there's I love this scene where. So they realize that this thing is an alien and it can it kills people and it takes the form of whoever it can kill. 
And there's a scene where they realize that one of the people in the room is the thing. Mm. And they realize that it's, uh, it's, always it's weakness is heat or fire. Hence why it's in Antarctica. And they test everyone's blood because they realize if you test the blood, then like you can figure out if something is like the alien or not. Mm. And Kurt Russell, they establish early on that he's human. So he's the one that they trust. So they tie everyone up and they like take a blood sample of each one and then one at a time he like lowers this like torch into the blood to like see who's see human or not. Which one reacts. And oh. it's like the first one doesn't react, okay you're human, second one doesn't okay you're human, then the third one when they put the flame on it, it like jumps up at them and it's like, Oh shit <laughs> you know, like it was it was it was uh, Quinn and I watched this a lot when we lived in Southwest in college. Uh this I love this movie. You watched it a lot? Uh, when I say a lot, maybe like two or three times. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, that's my that's my number two. Here's Thanks. here's a picture of Ew. That, that I mean that sounds like a really good movie though. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's gross. Yep. Ugh. Okay. Alright. Number one. Are you right? Do you have a guess of what my number one might be? Yeah. Yeah? Get out. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it is Get Out. Um, it's it's perfect. It is like the perfect horror movie. And it meets that thing that we're saying like you want movies to get you to feel a certain way and change your perspective. And this one does that a thousand percent. Oh yeah. This was a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes for the longest time. It's It's like... You know, one of those thrillers that, like, the concept is, like, equally super far-fetched, but totally plausible at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it's just, like, oh, shit. I just love the little, like, meanings. Uh, I don't know I'm trying. Like, the metaphors that Jordan Peele does in them. Like, that, when, that's when they're, what when I'm they're, saying. Like, yeah, when they're bidding on, like, who wants to have his body, and it's, like, it's kind of like back in olden days. It, people yeah. are bidding to buy people, you know. It's, it's like ex- yeah, exactly. So I and that's it was so good. Yeah, so so good. I hundred percent agree. It. And you're right. Like this is one where like they did build in that historical like that meaning to it. Yep. And I think one of the things with horror movies is I think they have, they have to do that extra effort to do it. Whereas like if you just have a good drama that could get nominated for best picture with less historical meaning behind it. But a horror movie, you kind of need to go that extra effort in order to get a nomination, which this did. Did, yep. Mm-hmm. So that's my number one. It's my number one. This is where I might have cheated a little bit to an extent. <laughs> eh, maybe how, not. How can you cheat on your own top five? Eh, that's fair. So my number one is Alien. <gasps> nice. Because the way they classify it, the first alien is classified as a horror movie, which I think it is because you like never see the alien until the end. It's kind of just this, mm-hmm. which is kind of why Jaws is mm-hmm. probably classified because mm-hmm. you never see the shark oh, until yeah. the end. And then the, the sequel aliens, uh, it's classified as like just an action movie. Yeah. So they're, they're different, but they're both yeah. great in their own ways. And alien is, oh, uh, this movie is so good. And it's so like, I don't want to say creepy, but it's just you have the small glimpses of the alien here and there, and you just don't know what's going on. And that scene, you know, the first time you see this movie and the, that dinner scene where uh, one of the characters had, like, the alien on his face, and then it just came off, and they're like, okay, I guess you're fine. And then they're all sitting at dinner kind of before they go into uh, hypersleep or whatever before going off into space, and all of a sudden he just starts convulsing or whatever you want to say and then bam an alien pops out of his stomach like that scene is so horrifying and i don't know this is just one of the all-time like that, great the acting movies is so good like, yeah it's, just, it's and all even, around a good and, movie and i'll even say like i love that in the sequel uh sigourney weaver got nominated for best actress for it that's awesome but i think this movie could have easily been nominated for best picture uh, it came out in seventy nine, so in nineteen seventy nine, it's a ninety seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, this movie is so good. Even the the first trailer for it is kind of like creepy and ominous, where they just show an egg, and it's like a voiceover saying, you know, a couple lines, and then the egg opens up, and that's the end of the trailer. So that's my number one. Uh, some people might call it like a sci-fi movie or whatever, but I think it's a horror enough to be classified as a horror movie. And I think 
that that could have been a Best Picture nominee for sure. I have some honorable mentions. Oh, yeah. You know, other movies that I was considering. I, I already mentioned Zodiac and Scream. Um, two others. And, and I'm realizing most of my movies are recent, but I, I've i just literally never seen, like, old-time no, scary movies, I guess. So, um, I have, so that's what I'll talk about. <laughs> uh, another honorable mention I had is 1408. I've seen that with John Cusack is, and Samuel Jackson. Yes. That's a good one. That that's that's a good, uh, just like psychological kind of. I feel like that movie. was one of the first good horror movies in a while. Yes. Like I felt like horror movies for the, like and the nineties and everything. It's got a good twist. Yeah, like I felt like horror movies in the nineties and even into the early two thousands before this came out. They were just slasher gory movies that were pointless. And this one was one of the first ones I remember that were that was like yes, this is a good movie. Yes, yes. So. Uh, really like that movie, and again, this one's not really a horror movie, but Signs. I remember the first time I saw Signs, and, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's kind of like Alien to Nick extent where it's like, you hear about the aliens, you hear about the aliens, but you don't see them, you don't know what's going yeah. on, you got this crop circle, and then, uh, that birthday party hidden camera yeah. footage of the alien, like, stuck Oh my god, the first time I saw that, like, I almost peed my pants. It was so scary. I remember, and again, like, when you see the alien, like, in the house at the end, yeah. and you're just like, oh my god. I remember, I saw that in theaters. Me. Yes, I did too. And the scene I remember kind of freaking me out was, it was at night, and Mel Gibson was, like, putting oh, the kids I'm, to I'm, bed. I'm thinking of one. Right and now. all of a sudden, he, like, looks out the window, and you see, like, a shadow figure on the roof through the window like you can't uh-huh. see what it is but you just see like a humanoid shadow and i just remember freaking out and like that's when walking phoenix runs out and they're like looking on the roof and you can and the dogs hear, barking and yeah stuff. and you can kind of hear footsteps <gasps> we're gonna have to watch this movie again well, i know well and then i just thought of i'm pretty sure this is in signs yeah because like the kids having like an asthma attack yeah. and he's sitting there and then all of a sudden the alien hand just <laughs> grabs oh, him in the basement like, ah! in the yes. basement yeah yes. yeah oh, I was my God. like the hand's okay. just there blending in and then it yeah okay the more we talk about the movie the scarier it feels yeah. so maybe maybe i don't feel that bad for having yeah. that on my hands. No, there you <laughs> it go. is yeah. a scary movie yeah. so those are did you have any yeah i had a couple um some of these i had on here as honorable mentions just i haven't seen them that's why i didn't want to put them in my rankings uh, Rosemary's Baby, which came out in the 70s, Roman Polanski movie. Uh, the Others, which you brought up, and I'm happy you did. I haven't seen Midsommar yet, which came out earlier this year, but I've heard good things about it. And it's the same director as Hereditary, which I mentioned oh, earlier, okay. which a lot of people expected that to get nominated last year, and it didn't. So that's probably a disappointing one there. But I also had It, which you brought up. Halloween, the, orig- the f- original one. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Probably not best picture worthy, but that's a really good movie. And then the two that were kind of tough to keep off my list, but I just kind of had to. Uh, a Quiet Place. Oh, yeah. That one was really good. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's that one was very good. Uh, and then I brought it up a couple episodes back, and this is more of a monster movie than anything, but American Werewolf in London. Yeah. That one, that was on TV recently, and I watched a little bit of it. That one... That one's a good one. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That is wrapping up this week's episode. Tune in next week. We will be talking about Knives Out and Ben-Hur, which is the classic Best Picture winner from 1959. Subscribe to the podcast. Give us a five-star rating. Write us a review. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Pod. And go see a movie this week.